Hey everybody, it's episode 43 of the About to Break podcast, and I'm going to be totally honest with you, I have no idea how to start this show. This week has been just kind of accumulation of crazy things happening in the world, and violence, and loss of people that we love as artists, and I really struggled. I, I thought, do I not put out a podcast this week? Do I say something? Do I not say something? And... In an effort to just try to figure out what to do, all I can say is that the best thing we can do as humans, as individuals, as artists, is to love people. Love people through what you do, uh, through who you are, hug your family, love your neighbors. There's nothing I can say that doesn't sound trite or, in my mind, inappropriate, but there's also nothing else I know to do other than to love people and this week I've got on the show Arthur Trace who's just an amazing artist he's an an incredible guy he's a magician and this conversation we talk about the importance of creating things that transport people you know one of the reasons I love magic is not that it's an escape but that it, it gives people a Santa Claus moment it takes people back to a moment in their life or in their childhood where wonderful things were possible And right now, I'm honestly just hoping that wonderful things are still possible, that we can come to a point where we love others and we care for one another and we put out art, not because it's self-motivating, but because it's just important for people to experience beautiful things. If you go to Arthur's Twitter page, one of the things you're going to see is his bio line just simply says, trying to make something beautiful. I can't think of better words for us right now with all the nonsense going on then, hey, you know what, today and whatever you do at your work, with your family, with your friends, let's try to make the world a little more beautiful today. No, I'm not a writer. Okay. Something is about to break. I do want to say this about Arthur. He is one of the most creative, artistic, original magicians that I've ever met. And uh, anyone who ever says, I don't like magic or I don't enjoy magic shows has not experienced what Arthur does. He's able to create moments that transport people uh, to a different world, to a different place. We talk about so many things in this conversation and it's the first conversation we recorded outdoors. We were in LA and (laughs) there was a bunch of people around and I had headphones on and I got really loud and it got really awkward, but it's a great conversation. Arthur came out to our Jokers and Aces show and closed the show and did an amazing job. In fact, the next Jokers and Aces is this Sunday, October 8th at 7 p.m. at the Nerdist Showroom at Meltdown Comics. Uh, if you'd like to get tickets to that, I'd love to see you there. Just click on the link here and you can get some discounted tickets to buy those pre-sale. It has become my favorite show that I do all month long and I would absolutely love to see you guys there. But I know you're going to love this conversation. Such a good guy. So much insight. Sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Arthur Trace. Welcome to About to Break. I'm your host, Taylor Hughes. And this week, I am joined by my buddy, Arthur Trace. Hey, Taylor. Thank you for being here, man. Thanks for having me. We are outside. This is the first time we've ever recorded outdoors. We are at one of my favorite places in L.A. It's Aroma Cafe in how, Studio City. How did you find this? Do you remember the first my person, wife. right? Oh, the, Actually, yes. when I first moved to L.A., I lived off of uh, Camarillo. Okay. Near Camarillo in Tahunga, and this place was literally about a mile away. It's absolutely wonderful. It's got a, a very cool vibe, and it's indoor-outdoor. I love it. Yeah. I mean, this is a place where you could literally sit down for hours on end, daydreaming about stuff that you want to, you know, put into your show or, or what have you. How often do you do that? Every Monday. Every Monday. So this is your spot. You come on Mondays. I, I Often I'll do that every Monday. Every, every Monday, I will say, I will come here and get a mocha. I call it my Mocha Monday. <laughs> and That's I, great. And depending on how much time I have that day, I may sit, stick around with a notebook and just kind of zone out. Yeah. yeah. Is Monday your... Uh, I know every day is kind of got to have some creativity to it, but is Monday your general, like you said, your daydreaming kind of... Thinking so, of new ideas. I'm kind of like a schedule Nazi where <laughs> I love it. I'll come up with a schedule every Sunday, and that's basically my schedule for Monday through Saturday. So it's not, it varies from week to week? Uh, typically, but Mondays and Tuesdays, I usually uh, put aside for business. Okay. And then the, the rest of the week, Wednesday through Saturday, 
I will usually be involved with, uh, you know, rehearsals or getting ready for gigs on the weekends or kind of creative stuff where I, you know, hopefully come up with the great idea, you know, the next great the idea next that's great going idea. into my show. Yeah. yeah. But do you and your wife, I know Katie and I do this constantly. We, we always have, like on Sunday night, we'll talk about what does this week look like? And then almost every night we go, okay, what does tomorrow <laughs> look like? Because our schedules are so... Not so much because it's pretty much now set in stone where my wife works in nine it's well she actually gets up fairly early she, uh, in the morning and she gets into work at seven okay works yeah. until four gets home around 4 30 and then we have dinner around 6 30 but cool. that being said usually the evenings are reserved for us just chilling out usually watching one of our favorite programs or something like that on the couch and then getting to bed fairly early because she's a terrible sleeper uh, she, and so I can't really stay up late because if I do and I get into bed, she's going to completely be awake for the rest of the night. Oh, she just has a hard time sleeping hard time, in general? Hard time sleeping in general. It's, My wife all of a sudden has had a hard, really hard time sleeping at night. Yeah, I think the older you get, uh, I'm not calling <laughs> so, your wife old here. No, but, <laughs> we're, all, we're all getting older. This is happening. But the older you get, you just get, uh, you know, your sleeping habits change and not for the better. Yeah. Uh, but that said, so I'll... I'll, I'll we generally work early on in the morning through the afternoon, early evening, and then it's just me and her chilling out. So to answer your question, yeah, getting back to the whole schedule thing, uh, not so much because our schedules are, like I said, kind of like established yeah. where we know what you know how each of us operate, and so we kind of uh, play off of each other. And we're, I mean, we've been married now for oh wow, eight years, Jeez, going on man. eight years. So, so cool, yeah. In LA, that's like forty years. I know. Right? <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not. I'm not a you know statistic. So yeah, you've be, you've beaten the odds. <laughs> it's like it's like what a restaurant only lasts a year and a marriage lasts like six months or something. Yeah, like something, that. something like that. If, unless you're <laughs> unless you're uh, like what Britney Spears or Kim Kardashian. Right, right. It was like that evening or something. <laughs> you so you guys uh, do you have shows you watch together? I know you said you guys will sit yeah, down and so yeah we have some shows like uh, America's Got Talent. It's yeah. one of the shows that we like to watch together. That's they're uh, they're going through the finals right now. Yeah, it's always, the finals were last night. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, always funny when you turn on TV and you see people you've worked with or you know. See and, a lot of people. <laughs> see a lot of people you know. And you're like excited, but then also kind of like ah. yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It's like, why can't I be number one on America's <laughs> <laughs> That show's so funny, too, because it's like it, people will be so invested. It'll be down to two people. Uh-huh. And then within three weeks, nobody remembers the second runner-up. Like, <laughs> they much. were almost the greatest entertainer, according to uh, America's yeah, unless, you, unless you get a, a show like Matt Franco did in Vegas. And now they, I think That's they just true, recently yeah. converted it because it was doing so well to the Matt Franco Theater. Wow, I actually that's haven't cool, seen the man. show, but uh, you know, good for him. Yeah, and I remember just not to cut you off. No, I, remember, no. I remember doing a NACA conference uh, where I was doing like a booth demo. Yeah, this was this was like five or so years ago, and Matt Franco was doing the same thing. He was doing a booth oh, demo. Oh wow, yeah. So he was working in the college market. I was just trying to uh, see if the college market is suitable to me. It wasn't. End of yeah. story. But it was funny that I got to see him before he blew up and became the next big thing. Did, did you figure out colleges weren't for you by going to that conference or by doing my act? some? No, I, I, <laughs> Arthur, I would have told you. Yeah, that, I mean your your act, and I will have raved about you already by the time people hear about this. But <laughs> incredibly theatrical. It it really is not the kind of show you you want to be doing in a cafeteria. Yeah. When people didn't know there was going to be a show. <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I've worked those gigs. Uh, you know, I'm able to uh, flex my show in certain ways in certain venues to accommodate certain performing situations. Yeah. But I, that's not what I'm going for. You know, yeah. I want to I, I wanna have a long career doing this, and performing in cafeterias <laughs> is the fast way out of this career because it's so frustrating. Right. And performing in those types of venues. But, yeah, I the reason I went towards the college market because it was a low-hanging fruit. At least I thought it was a low-hanging fruit, but you know what? I approached the college market. I tried to get in with some agents. Yeah. I couldn't get any showcases. I said, what the hell? Yeah. You know, I had uh, I had all these accolades amongst my peers, right. but I couldn't get a college gig. You know, it's... So, so I decided, yeah. uh, you know, not for me. 
<laughs> it's a different vibe, man. And I've and I've toyed with the idea of it, but I honestly think I don't have the abs for a college market because I feel like most of it is like, you know, yeah, I, trying to be young and sexy, and young I also and do magic. Yeah, pretty much. Young, I'm, young. I'm not young or sexy. You got to wear the skinny <laughs> jeans and the sport jacket. And oh do yeah, the, you know the shitty comedy, comedy <laughs> magic. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, that said, there are some great. Uh, comedy magicians out there. Derek Hughes is one of the great comedy oh, magicians that's working yeah. in the college market. Yeah. But he's great for that market. Yeah. Uh, I I just wasn't I wasn't a good fit for that market. It's like being an actor in Hollywood where you are uh, you know kind of a dork. Yeah. You know, I, I guess you could kind of fit me into that type. <laughs> but you're trying to go for the leading man roles. Right. That was where I was at with the college market. Yeah. yeah. When you you did some acting when you came to LA, right? I did, yeah. I, I still actually have an acting agent that uh, doesn't really send me out much anymore just because I sent him so many book out dates because I don't really want to <laughs> audition. Uh, but yeah, I actually uh, was with the Brian Reese studio, yeah. a commercial acting studio, and then I was also with Ivana Chubbuck for three years. Very cool. Ivana Chubbuck, uh, I went through all the way from the uh, beginning stages with her, uh, you know, with the studio up until the master class where I actually studied under Ivana. And that was great because, man, she tore, she tore me apart. And yeah. it was great to be torn apart as an artist like that and, and to be built up. Talk and, about that, man, the idea of it being great to be torn apart because that's one of the things that I hear people why they don't enjoy it is the critical eye but well, let me let me let me rephrase that i don't think it's great to be torn apart it's great for you to be torn apart in the long run because you're just going to benefit from it in the long run if you can take it and yeah. what i mean by that is really take that advice essentially yeah. what it is is constructive criticism uh and apply it in such a way that will make you grow as a person as an artist but ultimately, you're going to grow first as a person and then as an artist. Yeah. And Ivana was great because she really, she was one of those people that could really see through you. Yeah. And, and knew when something wasn't genuine or if you weren't telling the truth. Yeah. Uh, uh, as an actor. Uh, and the way she would she would deal with her students was all on an individual case by case basis because okay. not not everybody was was the same but i remember being in a doing a scene and almost shaking right before to yeah. go up in front of her uh, because you had to go so deep down inside into who you are yeah. to bring that character uh, to your own persona and and into life that it was it was it was quite challenging and but it, I think it made me a much better performer in the long run because I, w I went there. See, and this is a, a thing that I truly uh, respect about you as an artist and as an individual is that in the shows we've done together throughout the years or even just when I've been up at the castle and caught you doing a set in the parlor, there's never been a time that I've been either with you at a show or seen you do a show that you didn't honestly ask for notes afterward. And a lot of guys will ask for notes just so that they can hear you say they did a great job. But even after that, you're like, okay, but what did you think about this? Or did this feel that way? And you've always been able to continue to improve because you're willing to hear what other people think. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we just did a show. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Joker's and Aces And show. you did plug, so good. <laughs> so freaking good. It was uh, amazing. Well, oh, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, but I, I asked you immediately afterwards, and I, actually a second time when we were on the phone later yeah. on, I, re I really wanted to uh, go deep and, and, and see what you thought of some of the material. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, you know, I think as artists, as creative people, as human beings, we all just want to be told, man, that was the best thing ever. Right. But at and so I'm the same way. I'm human. But that being said, I do want to be told the truth. So if you saw something that you shouldn't, that as a magician, you shouldn't right. have seen as an audience member, I want to know that. Yeah. It's going to hurt in the beginning, but I want to know that. I want that feedback. Uh, if you thought something was slow, I want to hear that. If you thought that it sounded too scripted or too canned, I want to hear that. I basically want to evaluate the whole the whole performance while it's still fresh in the audience's mind uh, to get that feedback so I can have notes to work off of. Right, yeah. Well, and that's one of the things with, with artists is that we're creating things and we're putting them out there for other people. 
but so often you'll have an idea of what it looks like in your head. I mean, how many times have you been on stage and your mind is racing a million miles a second thinking about the face that person's making or is this working? And so it's important to hear people on the other end tell you what it is that they're actually exactly. experiencing because when you're on stage, your experience is not always reality. <laughs> No, no, and, and being a very much an anxious person that's in his head, yeah, because I overthink things. It's that's totally the case, where what I'm thinking is going on or perceiving the audience is taking in, yeah, isn't necessarily truth, true, you know, the truth all or most of the time. So I want that feedback, and that and I and I I, I go after that feedback, yeah. Uh, you know, anytime we become content with our material, that's usually when the material tends to suffer. Somebody broke something. Yes. Right? Someone just was murdered <laughs> right next to us. <laughs> Sorry, you were saying anytime you get content, the material starts to suffer? Yeah, anytime you get content, complacent, the material tends to suffer, mm. I feel. You know, that being said, being an anxious person, if you can, re- you know, become so relaxed on stage, there's, there's a... A part of you is going to give such a great performance because you're going to be truthful to you. Right. I mean, they're going to really see who you are, and you're going to be laid back, and, and that's great. But what I'm talking about is more so in terms of moving forward and not being, you know... Uh, not getting stuck and... Getting so... For instance, some of the pieces that I performed in my show, I've performed them so many, so often and over so many years that I performed them a certain way year after year. Right. Where I didn't think about it. And then it's not until somebody points it out and then you start really thinking about it, oh, maybe that secret move that I was doing wasn't so secret all along. Oh. You know? We trick ourselves as magicians sometimes into thinking that we are yeah. fooling the audience. Yeah. And <laughs> Just because no one will tell us. <laughs> I think it all... It, all, it all yeah. It's, I mean, it all comes down to the, the, the nitty-gritty details. Yeah. Because if you can really tear something apart... Yeah. And, and and if you can tear it apart to the level that with your own eyes you can't see any other fault right oh yeah that's a good point to be in because then that's you've done everything you can and then from that point on you ask for feedback whether it's from a director or from friends or people that you respect and trust yeah that you know that aren't going to blow smoke totally. or or that are just going to want to see you succeed Man, this is so freaking good because so I feel so many artists, whether it's magicians or comedians or mus- artists, you use that term very loosely. <laughs> <laughs> Creative types, yeah. Uh, well, so, sometimes that's performer loose. types. Performer types, yeah. It's I, I a just, bigger box to put it all in. I find this this way of being so refreshing because. I mean, we run into guys all the time that think they're the greatest and they think they killed every show, and you know they didn't, and and. As a performer, you can gain so much perspective by being open to hear feedback. Sure. Yeah, you, you certainly can. And I feel, you know, you, ha- you do have to be careful the feedback you get, though, because I don't ask everybody for feedback. Yeah. You just have to know that person. And res- I think it's important to respect that person because if yeah. you don't respect them, the feed- that, that feedback is not Doesn't going to count. Doesn't matter at all, yeah. yeah. Uh, but ultimately, whatever feedback you get, it all comes down to one thing, and that's being honest with yourself and being truthful yeah. to yourself. Because if somebody tells you something and it doesn't fit you and it's not truthful, that feedback could be correct, but it's not correct for you. So yeah, you also have good. to take that into consideration. Yeah. There's the being willing to hear it from people, but then also, you know, being smart and how you filter. Yeah. And I think it's, you know... Being, you, you also have to, it's, it's walking a fine line because you have to be open-minded, but you also have to have a vision as right. an artist uh, where you want to, like I said, you want to remain truthful to what you want to communicate to the audience and, and hopefully the people that you ask and respect can also see that. You, you keep talking about what you want to communicate to the audience and I think that's a cool thought to, to jump off on because... Mm-hmm. I think a lot of times magicians just go, I want to do this effect. Yeah. And then they go, what? You know, this is where patter (laughs) comes in. Like like that word patter that isn't used anywhere else but in magic is so weird because (laughs) magicians are like, all right, here's the trick I want to do. And the words are the things that I just say while I'm doing the trick. That's sad, isn't it? It is sad. It is sad. But you're, I mean, as much of a storyteller... The words it, are equally as important. Yes. Sometimes not more so because the words 
uh, unless you're doing a silent piece, but off, but even if you're doing a silent piece, you have a script. Yeah. Because a script isn't just words. A script is actions. A script is blocking. Uh, so everybody should have a script. Does your creative process usually flow with, here's something I want to say, and then what's an effect that's going to help me say oh, that? Oh, I wish. I or wish do I... you go, oh, here's an idea for an effect. What does that effect mean to the world? <laughs> I, I wish, I wish, I wish it was the uh, you know what I want to say. Yeah. And then how am I going to say it? Ideally, that I mean that's the, that would be the goal of, yeah. to do to do something that's considered high art and magic. Yeah. Um, but oftentimes there's no formula for it, so my ideas come from various different places. Uh, I will say that some of the pieces that I've you know happily have come to me. Uh, you know, some of those pieces did work out that way where it was, here's what I wanted to say, and now I've got to search the effect or the, you know, the actions to make yeah. the magic happen to say it, yeah. you know, so, but it all, it all, it all varies. That creative process is, it's so, it's so different depending on how, you know, what place you are at, at any particular given moment or what you may be working on. Yeah. Um, but ultimately I want the magic to be the star. Uh, you know, I want because that's what I'm doing. I'm a magician. I'm not. Huh. A, I'm not a singer. I'm not a. I'm not a playwright. I'm a magician. So yeah. that's where the focus is, and I want the magic to be highlighted and and, and, oh. and to be the star. That's good, man. I'm trying to think of how to say or how to bring this up without well, saying. Well, like. well I, for instance, when I used to, when I used, to, well, here's an example. When I used to lecture for magician audiences. Yeah. Uh, I had a little bit of theory in my lecture. And I usually found that the best routines, I like to call them routines, but the best pieces in my show had this symbiotic relationship between the effect. So for, for those of you who aren't magicians out there, basically the effect is the magical effect, right, which, which I'm talking about that the audience sees or perceives. And then uh, the premise, the premise being the presentation, the idea behind well, everything that you're doing on stage. Yeah. Uh, so... The best routines, at least in my show, that I've found have that sort of clear relationship and communicating the magic in such an efficient way, but also being true as an artist and what I wanted to get across to an audience. Totally. Uh, was that the premise provided the reason why the effect took place. Okay. And the effect provided the proof that the premise was true. Oh, that's interesting. So, I do this piece, and in in, in this is just an example from my own show. I do this piece uh, called The Floating Rose. It's a, it's a classic of magic now, at least, yeah. uh, by a magician by the name of Kevin James. Yep. And it's basically uh, a little piece of tissue paper that's animated and then is eventually uh, shaped, and then that paper rose is floated. Yeah. Uh, uh, and... Uh, then there's a, a twist to the end. Right. But anyway, I wanted to come up with a, pre a premise that really made that effect personable to me with my creative vision. Yeah. So I came up with the concept of invisible bees. It's so cool. And uh, <laughs> basically, I have this jar full of invisible bees, and when I crack it open, the audience can hear the buzzing of bees. Yeah. Well, one of the bees escapes. Yep. I quickly close the jar to prevent from any of the other bees escaping, and then this bee lands on my finger, at which point... I remove a piece of tissue paper and it crawls off onto the tissue paper. Yeah. I crumple it gently around the bee and suddenly yeah. when it buzzes, the paper starts to move. Anyway, more things happen uh, with that piece, but that was the general idea because I wanted to to motivate the, the action of the effect, the, yeah. the action of the magic taking place. Rather than just, oh, here's a tissue paper I can make. Yeah, you know, I, you have to give an audience a reason to care and it really comes down to, again, man. to why, why. <laughs> You know, uh, and that that has always been as my, as a magician, the thing that I, I, I strive to do is uh, come up with a reason why I'm performing something or yeah. why the magic is taking place, and that's usually my starting point. See, okay, this I'm so glad you're sharing this, man, because I love magic. I have since I was five years old, but the more I fall in love with it, the more I am frustrated with it. Sure. And one of my big frustrations is. Masters of Illusion? <laughs> <laughs> there, it's it's kind of like uh, people think that they hate jugglers, but they've never seen a real juggler. Like you know what I mean? But like, there's so much bad magic, and there's so many guys who their only thought process is, 
here's something I can do that you can't. I'm so much cooler than you, uh-huh. or you're an asshole because you can't do this amazing thing that I can do. They may not think that, but that's the way every effect is presented because all it is is, you know, like Seinfeld says it. He's like, here's why I hate magic. Here's a coin. Now it's gone. You're a jerk. Or an asshole. Yeah, or racist, right? It's yeah. like this whole idea of just doing amazing things because you can do them is not... How do I say? It? When There's, you do the when you do the the when you do the invisible bees, you've taken a basic premise of a trick that's been around for a long time, and you've transformed it from being a magic trick into being this incredible moment. And when the audience watches you, not only are they seeing it happen, but you're experiencing it. They're seeing you experience this thing happen. I'm in, too. I'm in it with them. I, I think. Yeah, it's not. Look at what I can do. Magic is such a powerful form of entertainment that it shows what can be possible. And, yeah. And but art is so powerful. What what makes an artist, uh, you know, have a particular vision is that they they make you see the world through their eyes. Yes. If I can make the audience see the world through my eyes through my magic. Yes. Then, I'm I'm being truthful with myself yeah I'm, I'm communicating uh, what makes me me to the audience yeah and even though the invisible bees doesn't necessarily say anything deep it still communicates me with the audience and my point of view yeah. and how I see the world you know for instance uh, the, the classic trick where you have a coin in your left hand and you close your hands both yeah. hands you right. open up again and now the coin is in your right hand coins right. across yeah well, instead of the coin traveling across, let's look at it differently. Did the coin travel across or did your hands switch positions? <laughs> so it's all a matter yeah. of seeing whether you see the glass half full or half empty. Right. And having the audience go on that journey with you yeah. uh, and having them you know, experience how you see things. Right. So that's, that's essentially what I try to do in my show is I want... I want to bring the audience into my world and how I see things. Yeah. And and that the invisible bees piece, I just bring it up because it's a it's a perfect example of that. Right. Oh, and yeah. also motivating the magic and what we were talking about. Totally. Yeah. It's you know, one of the things that has challenged me with magic too is that you can't you this shouldn't be the case, but you can't walk into a music store and buy a guitar and walk out and immediately call yourself a guitarist. Mm-hmm. Because if you can't play it to the point where people go, wow, that was music. Sure. But magic does have this weird thing where the effects, the basic effects are good enough that someone can walk into a shop and 20 minutes later call themselves a magician. And some people don't know the difference. I may be wrong in this, uh, but I think it was Teller from Penn and Teller. Yeah. Uh, there's only one that said <laughs> magic is such a powerful art form that it can support a weak entertainer, oh, a weak artist. Oh, and I, I'm, I'm misquoting that. I know I am. Yeah, yeah, no, but it's so true, and it's yeah. exactly what you're talking about. Uh, but there's there's clearly more to it. And in and, 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 and going deeper in what you're talking about, I think a lot of people don't. They, they, you know, th- people listen to music on a daily basis, so yeah. they can they can tell a bad musician from a good musician. They don't see magic on a daily basis, right. so that's you're, one thing yeah, we're up against. You're uh, right, and you know that's a that's a big thing uh, that relates to what you're talking about. But yeah, magic is such a powerful art form that it can that it, it can support a weak entertainer, a weak artist, I, a weak performer. Yeah, we, yeah, we've seen it happen many, many, many. We've times. seen it happen many times. And this is one of the challenges too, when with um, marketed magic effects. Well, yeah, yeah. Ex- exactly. <laughs> and actually, going back to the, to effects that are very simple to do, I tend to pick things that are that that require some level of skill. Yeah. Because I I enjoy it. I enjoy the process of learning. Yeah. I enjoy the process of challenging myself to be able to pull off something invisibly in front of an audience right successfully yep you know i don't i i tend to shy away from self-working yeah yeah, yeah. you know effects well and that's that's another way to protect your act is that it's not easy to replicate sure you know? i mean even even effects that i do that have been done how do i say i i tend to um uh, 
I'm attracted to very ballsy moves mm -hmm. or things that most people aren't willing to like a watch steal. Like I do watch steals on my show, mm -hmm. which is not in and of itself magic, but the effect of taking or the uh, the actual process of going up to someone, taking something off them without them knowing. Most people will never watch. try. No, I am not <laughs> taking your watch. It's a very nice. What kind of watch is that? Uh, well, we won't say that on air because it costs a lot of money. Uh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, I'll show you the back of this later. But anyway. Oh, man. You know it's a good watch when the back is as pretty as the front. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's another hobby of mine. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I I think it's great that you do you, you strive for, for things that are, you know, take some guts to perform. Because w when you do that, you're vulnerable on stage. And if you... Uh, you know, if you were to screw that up, for instance... Then, oh, and I have. <laughs> then you're just naked up there, yeah. you know? But oh, that's totally. A, that's the beauty in doing something, because you're so vulnerable. Yeah. And in, and when you do pull it off, and, you know, hopefully a lot of rehearsal and practice times go, goes into that, where, you know, you're, you, you establish a certain level of confidence and probability that you will be able to pull it off. Uh, yeah. Uh, at that point, it's really rewarding, because you know you, the, the amount of work that's gone into it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like the fact that your pieces, although they may not be, here's my life and how I grew up and where I was from, each one of your pieces, I feel like I get to know you a little bit better, your perspective or the way your imagination works. I think it's because it all comes from me. Yeah. Uh, not every single thing. Like, you know, there's there's a lot of pieces in my show that are based on classics of magic, like the egg bag, for instance. Yeah. But my egg bag is, I hate that trick, by the way. Uh but I don't think I've seen you do it. I, don't, I did it on Pan Telefoulis. I didn't see oh, it. Watch it. It's, oh my uh, goodness. Anyway, uh, it's a piece where I, I stop time. Awesomeness. So it's all, it's it's about time travel. It's not an egg. It's, it's about not a, about yeah. It's not about an egg in a bag. And that's I perhaps that's what you're relating to. Yeah. You're talking about because to me it's a, it's a way of communicating myself and what I was talking about before. Yeah. Uh, and it all comes it all comes from me. Uh, and and I think. An audience can detect passion and truth. Right. And I'm very passionate about what I do. And and I think, you know, it's important to to be passionate, obviously, and also, but more importantly, be truthful. Yeah. Because an audience can really detect when you're BSing them. Yeah. Uh, when you're a hack or when you're, uh, when you're performing something that you don't love. Yep. They can really detect that. It's 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 a visceral thing yeah. that takes place in a performer, uh, a piece that they they've created and they perform in front of an audience. There's a certain love, uh, sometimes hate relationship with it that you know the audience can really see, and and you're and you become vulnerable because of that. Yeah, and they can really they can really get a sense of who you are through that whole process. How do you? And I keep saying artist because you are an artist, and magic Thank is you. magic is just your medium. Like, I know you draw as well, but like you could have picked any other vehicle and chosen to be an artist. Well, I, I could I couldn't be a singer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get that straight, or any sort of musician. But uh, I sometimes feel like singers. Like I know they got to work hard, but there is no, no, no. The, I, I can I can you know, never be but, a singer. No, but I, I'm not saying you could. I'm saying like most talents. While you may be prone to something, singing, you're pretty much either a good singer or a bad singer. And you can learn to control your voice and all that. But, like, if I can't carry a tune, I could practice all day long and I'm not getting, you know, I, uh -huh. I kind of feel like singers get a head start. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> like, you know, but you have to love it, yeah, you know. That's true. Because there's a lot of, I'm sure, talented people that can sing that don't necessarily love it and that's why they don't do it. But you right. see them in karaoke bars yeah, and that's, that's true. That's yeah. fine. But you you certainly have to you certainly have to love it. Well, you you went from loving it to deciding I'm going to make a career of this. What was that like? I mean, oh, when, when I mean, did you know I want to try to do this for a living? So I had been doing magic as a hobby off and on uh, ever since I was eight years old. Yeah. And in freshman year of college, yeah, I saw David Copperfield at my university. Oh yeah, University of Illinois in Champaign Urbana. And that was pretty much was it. This, that was, was pretty this much it. The dreams and nightmares. Yes, that was the dreams and nightmares. Oh start. man! Yeah, it was so good. <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> so good. And uh, it was theater. It was like it wasn't like. Yeah, I you mean know. the smell of 
fog, the oh, smell yeah. of that fog, and yeah, uh, yeah, it I smell mean, a little it, bit like pancake syrup. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying this episode of the About to Break podcast. Three quick ways that you can help us out here at About to Break. The first one is to go on iTunes and leave us a review. Uh, if you enjoy the program, please leave us a five-star review. Big thank you to everyone who's already done that. If you haven't yet, please jump over to iTunes. You'll need your iTunes account information. Uh, but you can click on the podcast, leave us a five-star review. Just leave us a one or two sentence little blurb there. Let people know what you like about it. That helps us out huge. Second way you can help us at About to Break is by becoming a producer. Uh, our goal is to have a thousand people given at least a buck a month to help offset the cost of producing these shows and it does take time and uh, it is a passion project i will continue putting these out for free because i think it's a helpful conversation uh, but anything you can do to help us out by producing the show would be awesome go over to about to break podcast.com click on become a producer and see what that's all about last thing that you can do and this one is also a real a real simple way of making a difference is just sharing the podcast all right. When you see it out there on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, go ahead and follow along and then share it with your friends. Let someone else know how much you liked it because it sure does make a difference. All right. Back to the program. <laughs> that was that was pretty much it for me because I, I was I was bouncing through uh, uh, between a couple of majors and I thought, what the heck am I going to do when I graduate? I yeah. mean, I was a freshman, so I had some time, but I I felt pressure to really make a decision, and I saw that show at a good time, and it just kind of clicked with it clicked in me. Yeah. Uh, were you were you performing uh, like shows like paid shows at this point? No, or was no, I was just a hobby. It was just a hobby. I was still just doing it as a hobby. Yeah. And. From that point on, after making that decision, I formed uh, a club at the university called the Midwest Masters of Magic. Nice. I love that. And you just, you yeah. just started it and already you're masters. Well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's kind of like Masters of Illusion. Yeah, yeah. we're going to get to that because it's a second <laughs> reference to it. We'll get back. I'll, I'll, put a, I'll put a pause on that. We'll come back to that one. But, okay, so uh, you started the club. So I started a club with the... Uh, because the reason I started the club is yeah. we had all these great theater spaces at the university. I mean, it's a it's a Big Ten university, thirty seven thousand yeah. undergrad students. Yeah, and they had all these great theater facilities on campus. I'm like, what's a way I can produce a show in some of these theaters? Oh, totally! You got a playground. Form your own organization. <laughs> then you get the facility for free. Yeah. Oh yeah. So that that was the that was the uh, that was the reason for forming the Midwest Masters of Magic that ceased to exist as soon as I graduated. But <laughs> I did uh, produce three shows, and I learned a lot in those shows. And the, there's some videos from those shows. Oh that, yeah. Oh, it's so terrible. What was your? Well, nobody will ever see. <laughs> nobody. You still have them though, huh? Yeah. I still do. <laughs> what was what was the? Uh, do you remember the first original piece you worked on? The first original piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was really into manipulation, uh, and I—I I mean, that was like for those of you who are not magicians, he means dexterity, not yes, yeah, so taking sl- advantage of people. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I was going to say something political there, but then I just realized the the, the analogy I was going to make—the person's not even a good manipulator. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> So it's basically sleight of hand on stage. Yeah. Uh, the only props you have are small objects such as playing cards, yeah. balls, uh, uh, any sort of object that you can fit in your hand that you can perform sleight of hand with. Yeah. So the, the first piece that I started really working on was uh, my manipulation act, if you will. Yeah. And it was after seeing Lance Burton perform oh, on his television on. special, I said, you know, yes. this is the type of magic I want to focus on. It's incredible. So I started working on that act, and the first original concept of that act was me being, oh, uh, so bad, being uh, playing the character of a French artist. I had a whole beret. Did you have a beret? I had a beret. Did you have a black and white striped shirt? I did. <laughs> yes! I did had, you have a fake mustache? That would have been the best. I don't remember. I don't recall. <laughs> I don't think I did. But it was this whole act where I'm pretending to sketch this... Uh, the still life of a candle and a candlestick and like a fruit bowl and stuff and I'm doing manipulation with these props. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, man, was it awful. <laughs> and then that went on to be something else where uh, I would enter magic competitions with this particular act. I would develop it over years. I mean, right. this, yeah, yeah. it took me about four years to get it to a the, to the concept that it finally would become a uh, being and that was my postmodern art act yeah where I interact with this abstract painting 
but the second wow. iteration of that was me doing a manipulation act uh, where uh, before I come on stage I have a table and on the table there's a sign that says Arthur Trace uh, something to the effect of elegant magic or oh. something like that and somebody is painting graffiti on it and says prove it <laughs> they paint prove it and, leave, yeah, yeah. and they leave the paint bucket behind Okay. and then I would come up on stage and see that they messed with my with my little advertising oh, and then I would prove that I was this elegant suave kind of yeah, act yeah, yeah. and so that was the second version of that act and then the third version that it finally turned out becoming was me interacting with this abstract piece of art on stage yeah. so it's interesting how it developed but that's great yeah and then when so you start you start working with that act and you're doing hopping on different shows and things like that uh, I would I would you know during this time I'm also t- doing close up magic yep uh, trying to do other things in my stage show but that was the one act that I really honed in on and I focused on and that's oh, yeah. the act that really grew at the very beginning of my you know career so I would be performing uh in Chicago on break time when I was like, uh, you know, you know, off from college on holidays or during the summer months where I would go and do strolling magic at a restaurant called Lalo's, which is okay. a Mexican restaurant that I actually performed strolling magic at for five years. Yeah. Uh, and then I would do other strolling private party work, that sort of thing. Uh, I would also perform, uh, you know, stand-up shows like a 30, 45 minute show for kids. Yep. Some, sometimes for adults. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the typical standard stuff that a lot of guys or, 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 or girls that are into magic kind of yeah. start out doing. You doing, uh, doing restaurant work, man, it really gives you thick skin, like, or helps. I, I actually enjoyed it. Yeah. I did. I, you know, at first it was tough going up to tables and kind of introducing myself. And yeah. Saying, hey, you want to see some magic? Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. whole thing. But I, I've kind of grew into it. And so, you know, even now when I do private party work sometimes, you know, technically they're higher end gigs. Right. Like I just did the, uh, I just did strolling magic at the, uh, the, the, uh, the creator of the Power Rangers, so yeah. there's a little different budget there. Right. But, oh, totally. But that being said, I, I enjoy the process of close of performing close-up magic and interacting with people yeah. at events. It's fun. It's fun for me. Some people don't enjoy it, but I, yeah. I kind of get a kick out of it. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I uh, I would always struggle when you go up to a table. Like I love magic so much that if someone came up and was like, "You want to see a trick?" I'd be like, "Yeah, I want to see a trick." And then there's those <laughs> moments when you get like people like, "No," you know, like. Well, my go- my whole approach is I introduce myself. So yeah. I lead with that. I, I say, you know, hi, my name is Arthur. And I c- kind of a, as if I was introducing myself to somebody at a party just socially. Yeah. And I think it's important to be interested in them yeah. and not just be interested in showing them something. Yeah. But for, be first off interested in them as human beings yeah. and kind of establishing rapport. Yep. And then and then after that introducing, hey, you know, I'm the I'm the close up magician performing tonight. I was wondering if I could show you a miracle. Yeah, oh that's good. You know? Well this comes back to to doing what you do to give other people an experience. Not just you know, we all started off as, uh, off as kids going up and be like, hey, mom, dad, watch, watch this, look at me. And it was just wanting them to see what you've worked on. And some guys, I, I'll run into guys at the castle doing this where they'll be working on stuff and 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 literally have no regard for whether or not people are going to dinner or they're late for something. or You know what I mean? Like, it, I think as artists, we've got to think, or as performers, we've got to think, Am I doing this to get something from someone, or am I doing it to give them an experience? Sure. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a great way of looking at it, because you know it's establishing that rapport with people. It's establishing a, a certain relationship with them. Because if they like you, they're going to want to see you succeed. They're going to yeah. want to see your magic. Let's say if you're walking up to them at a private event, and and and, and you are the entertainer there. Yeah. So, I think that's important. Uh, if you don't care about them, they're not going to care much about you or what that's you do. That's true. So, that's true. Yeah. Uh, as an artist, 
as a creative individual. You say that so pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just laughing because we're... Hold we're, on, let me get my cocktail. I know, I'm <laughs> laughing. We are outside at an outdoor cafe in Los Angeles <laughs> with microphones set up. Yeah. This, we could not be any more LA a unless beautiful we were woman passing by holding, every single moment, so. holding, <laughs> tiny, holding tiny dogs and drinking green smoothies. <laughs> Um, now that we've provided that visual for Right, you, totally. And you're oh, here with oh, us. I laugh. I just turned around. There's a lady holding that tiny yep. dog. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as an, as an artist who is making your living doing the thing you love, what are some of the challenges you face with, with the fact that this is no longer, you know, it, was, it started off as a hobby and it'd be fun to put shows on and all of that, but what are some of the things that you face having this as your career that you didn't face when it was just a fun kind of hobby thing next question <laughs> <laughs> and we're done uh, no I, I, well <laughs> there's many yeah uh, because all you know ideally the shows that I would love to be doing are the shows that people are coming there to see came me. to see a show it's so cliche because we all are uh, many of us right are that way yeah. we want to be the star yeah but it's so true because it all, that also that's also a good business plan yeah that's because true. if people are going to see you you're charging more you're not you're, in, you're and, not interchange you're not in the service industry anymore ah uh, this bit we were talking about this a bit earlier yeah. that that when you're performing for other people's audience as opposed to your own audience correct you're always waiting for the gig you know yeah and I think so ultimately it's that short answer but I've also been doing this for 16 years full time yeah and so at this point in my career I need to be doing that yeah I don't need to be doing uh, somebody's private event yeah well I do right now financially right but uh for my own artists persona I need to be doing the latter I need to be doing my own show yeah and so that's where I am in my headspace I I'd like to hang on this topic because most magicians I don't think think this way I don't think most magicians are thinking about how can I develop something that is that has gotten its own audience like I told you earlier that I had a freak out moment in the last six months and it was this idea that most of the guys that do what we do are doing what we're doing now for the next 30 years sure and and they're 60 years old sitting by the phone waiting for someone to invite them to perform for their event but what you're talking about is at this point you need to be developing an audience for your work I need to take that and I, I yeah I you know I've developed I I'm, I'm always developing the show. Yeah, oh yeah. But now it's a matter of being a part of something. It's not, it's not me fitting a part of some, somebody else's project. It's me being a part of a larger thing that, it, that I've spearheaded. Yeah. Uh, and that's difficult to do because there's, there's, there's different ways of doing that, but we're all different and we yeah. all operate differently. So it's kind of figuring out what you're good at and trying to forge that you know that path forward you know I talked about doing the college market or trying to do the college market before yeah. and that was one way that I was trying to dip my toe in, the, in that particular water right. because you can transition from the college market to other uh, venues of work right. but I quickly realized that wasn't for me obviously uh, but now I'm, 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 I'm really just more approaching uh, trying to do presenters conferences yep. and trying to pitch my show for tours yeah. at theaters. Yep. Also, uh, I'm, I've produced my show in the past at local venues here in LA. Yeah. And I'm looking right now for a, for a nice venue for a, a monthly do or like a residency. A re- kind of yeah, a certain yeah. residency that I can do, if not every month, every other month. Yeah. Something that would keep my creative thought process flowing and also building. At least slowly to start an audience, yeah, and hopefully, you know, at one point, bringing in investors when that time comes and right. say, "Hey, this is what I've got. Uh, can you help me take this to the next level?" And seeing where it goes from that point. This is this is a, a very um, interesting time to be in because I feel like there's more vehicles and avenues than there's ever been to, like, in essence, get your break. 
mm-hmm. used to be like you go on Carson and the next day you were famous, you know, because there was yeah. only three TV shows. But, but now there's so much more noise that it's so much more difficult to... Yeah for that when you do get that break for that right. break to really matter yeah oh yeah because there's so many people uh, for instance you're doing this podcast yeah 10 years ago or however many years ago you would not be a radio show host <laughs> it's true oh yeah oh yeah there unless, was like four unless, of them <laughs> unless, unless you were like you know the guy that that was your thing yeah oh yeah but you're a performer you know right you, you entertain for a living. <laughs> yeah it's cra- it's yeah. crazy like yeah there are more opportunities but like you said the noise I mean, what was it? The uh, I think this time on Netflix, Netflix at the Emmys was up for ninety-two Emmys. Really, ninety-two Emmys? Just Netflix original programming. Jeez, man, which is crazy. Awesome. Someone was saying. I heard someone talking about like five years ago. The best thing about Netflix was a scratched Finding Nemo DVD. Like, <laughs> and within five years now, they're making you know whatever it is, two hundred fifty original programs wow. a year or something. So That's- it's. Well, I think they're transitioning well because the whole DVD thing and the whole yeah. streaming thing, thats that, that model, that business model is also changing. Uh, so they're yeah. now getting into the role of producer. But, uh, yeah, it's... What were we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> we, were ta- we were just talking about, like, creating... Oh, the noise. The and noise, they, yeah, yeah. yeah the wanting to gain an audience, but how do you get to an audience that's so it's short, saturated I, with The content. honest answer, I don't know. I'm still experimenting and trying to find my own way. Yeah. And if I had that answer... I, You'd be doing I, it. I probably, you wouldn't be doing this podcast. I, 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 well, I, I probably be having a gig, you know, right. somewhere that is, uh, yeah, you know, on an ongoing basis. But you know, I mean, so after 16 years of doing this full time, I'm kind of at the point where uh, some days are very trying. Where yeah. it's not just, you know, getting up out of bed first thing in the morning and, and doing the magic thing. Yeah. I've done that, you know, and yeah. I'm, I still do it. And yeah. it's not as exciting as it used to be. So it's me finding that excitement again. Right. And that's that can that can be very hard because some days are really dark where you're yeah. like, you know what? I'm just going to go sell watches, you know, yeah. where, where something I, I enjoy as a, as a hobby. But maybe I get, you know, not having to think about my art yeah. would be a little bit healthier for me than thinking on a 24-hour-a-day yeah. basis. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not going to do that because ultimately at heart, I'm an artist. Right. You know, yeah. and I can't do that. I would die. Yeah. Well, and it's, and it's one thing, too, in those seasons where you've got a lot of work lined up and you've got shows. Getting up and working on stuff is exciting. Because you feel like, oh, I'm doing this because I'm going to go present it. And then there's those seasons, I don't know for you, but at least for me, where it's there's sometimes when it's like, I'll have no events for a couple of weeks and I'll just be going crazy. Sure, banging your head against the wall. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because when I have events that I'm performing at, then yeah, I'll rehearse and do that stuff. But that's not the exciting part for me. That's the more stable okay. part where I can take a back seat. You're talking say, about the creation of new work. And- when I'm, the thing that I get, the, the part that I really get so excited about is when, A, when I don't have to worry about money. Yeah, but <laughs> that's the best part. <laughs> that's, that's one of the, that's. What's that like, Arthur? <laughs> It's been a while, so I, you know, I've forgotten about it. But right. uh, the best part for me is well, sitting in a place like this, yeah, like a Roma Cafe, and really losing myself in the moment of, you know, not checking my freaking email every minute or so, or not checking social media, but really putting all that aside, yeah, and losing myself in my own mind and what I want to do next yeah whether it's on stage yep. most of the time it's on stage or in a close up performance or you know what I what do I want to put forth in my work and, and then working on that and actually making some headway that's what really excites me yeah that's cool how many projects or ideas do you would you say you have that are in the works at any given time. Like, do you keep notebooks of concepts, or do you? Yeah, tend I, to... I, have a, I have a notebook on my desk that I, I write in whenever the uh, w- you know when I'm working on something uh, or re- or reworking something because some some of the things in my show have taken over ten years to well, like that bell routine. Yeah, yeah. I was just I was just telling you. I've seen so many different iterations of that. That that piece I came up with in 2002, 2003. Yeah. Only now, what is it, 2017? 
that I feel, geez, it's 14 years, that where I feel that it's gotten to a point yeah. that it's almost finished. Which well, is like, so well, crazy. When I, and when because, I say finished, it'll never be finished. But what right. I mean is like it's gotten to the point where I'm happy with it. Yeah. And see, as as someone viewing it, the first time I saw you do it, what, seven or eight years ago, I was like, that's a great routine. Most guys would just stop with that, but you're constantly, this goes back to you constantly not only taking notes from other people, but being critical in a good way of yourself to say, I don't want to just do something that's good. I want to, I want to take an idea to where I've taken it to the max and really created something unique. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, you it, get that that's rare in this in this. Eugene Burger once right? told me when we were talking about a similar uh, a similar subject matter. And this was going on with Bob, my manipulation act. Yeah, I, I would session with him at times, and he yeah. would teach me how to think or how to use my thinking to the best of my ability. Anyway, he said, Arthur, in ten years from now, if you're still doing the same stuff yeah. or in the same way that you were doing it, yeah, you're going to be really disappointed. Uh, and it's true. If you, if any of us are doing the same material, now I'm still doing the same material, but the same way. Right. If you're still doing that piece in the same way yeah. that you started off doing it. You have not learned learned anything. Right. And that's a tragedy. Yeah. Relatively speaking, that's a tragedy. Right. Oh yeah. Speaking in terms of your own material. Totally. But uh, so I don't want to be. I don't want to be that guy. I yeah. know. I don't, don't want to be the complacent the uh, that that guy that just is not reworking or working on something new there that's a that's a huge motivator for me because I've I, I see guys now that when I was when I was 13 and a junior member at the castle and looked up to these guys because they were coming up with the most like the newest freshest ideas and then now you still see some of them who are who were great artists but have not changed a single thing about their act in 30 years. Mm -hmm. And it's just a motivator to go, I don't want to do that. Like I don't want I don't want the thing that's a passion to just become a job because then why are we doing it? Like there's so many better sure. ways to make money. And I hate that <laughs> and, I, and I hate that whole example of that a lot of magicians tout of coming up with that one great act and you can tour the world no that's bs man. it's not true that's, it's not true it's not only is it not true at least in this day and age maybe in the 80s or even yeah. before that you were able to make a career doing review shows and right stuff. oh yeah but one of the things that i don't want to be is an act uh, i don't i don't want to be an talk act. talk about that i don't want to be an you act. don't want to be the guy that does the thing with i want to the... i want to be i want to yeah. be I want to be, you know, known as an artist. I want to be known as a, and I want to be known for for being Arthur Trace. And yeah. I, I guess what I mean by that is that I want people to get to know me through my work, but not this one particular piece that's a novelty. Right. It's like a monkey in a zoo that performs a trick over and over again. Yeah, it may be a great act, right? But still an act, you know. I, yeah. I remember working the Wu Chow Circus Festival back in 2009 where you had all these great circus acts, some of them Cirque du Soleil quality acts, uh, but they were still just acts. I looked at these acts and I thought to myself, you know, in 20 years, they're still probably going to be doing something very similar to what they're right. doing now. Oh, yeah. But they're not going to be a draw. You know, they're yeah. going to always have to be a part of something. Yeah. I want to be the movement. I want to be... Like I said, what we were talking about before, I want people to come to see me. They're not going to come to see me for an eight-minute act. No. You know, they're going to want to come and see me for the experience I have to offer. Right. And hopefully that experience is a full evening show of some sort. Yeah. That has its peaks, its valleys, and uh, is in a, you know provides some sort of level of escape for my audience. Yeah. yeah. It's so encouraging to hear... To hear someone talk this way because there, there are those moments where I go why don't I just do the hacky thing that I know is going to work that do you know what I mean like not, I don't know what you mean <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what you mean because I, I, that's that's the low hanging fruit and see in fact, good, in fact when, anytime I anytime I come across something an idea let's say I come across uh, an idea hits me and yes. there's something similar yeah. out there I discard it. Beautiful. Because I don't want to be associated with anybody. 
I don't want to be. I don't want to. I don't want to be even confused by another act that it d- has done something similar. Yeah. No, I want to do my own thing. Yeah. Like it doesn't. I, I go to. I was just at Magic Live, and yeah. there were some professional magicians talking about the, the this this piece at the dealer's room and how great of an effect it was. It was some mentalism piece. Yeah. And they thought, isn't that great? I'm thinking. Jeez. Hell no. <sighs> It may be a great effect, but I don't want to do it. It did not come from me. Arthur, I was so on Facebook, which I never, I never go on Facebook and then get off Facebook and I'm happier. Like I'm never, <laughs> I'm never glad that I was on there, but I was on Facebook and I saw. I don't think anybody's ever glad. Oh, geez. We just keep doing on it. social media. I, I saw, uh, uh, I, I won't mention a name, but a performer who's a performer himself but is known for putting out tons of products for other performers. Okay. And some of them are brilliant, great ideas, right? And he was so excited. He posted today, I'm so excited. Because, you're pulling out your phone to see who it was? No, <laughs> no, no, I'm just getting some chaps. No, he says, I'm so excited because this new release is the most successful release I've had. I've had more magicians buy this really? than anything else. And I so badly wanted to comment, you just told me this is nothing I should ever do because everybody's going to be doing it. Like, mm, yeah. Like, I think the Lozander table is a, one of the most brilliant creations ever. Oh, it's great. I, it's also one of the things that everybody does. Mm-hmm. Or Kevin James bowling ball. Brilliant. I don't ever want to do it again because everybody does it. Yeah. Yep. You're just laughing. <laughs> No, I'm just smiling. laughing because you're talking really loud oh, in a cafe. I, oh, I'm sorry, guys. So we're at a cafe. Arthur does not have headphones on, but I do. I look. I must look ridiculous. I'm just yell, raving lunatic about magic tricks with headphones on. Sorry, guys. I apologize. No, but I, I agree with you. I think, uh, and it, but it, I think it, for me, it's and and this is probably sometimes where I kind of kick myself because. I'm a, I'm a little. Sometimes I feel I'm a little too strict, just because it came from somebody else. Perhaps that doesn't that shouldn't negate why I don't why I I wouldn't do it, yeah. or wouldn't choose to do it in my show. But I don't because I don't feel fulfilled, man. And I think that's why it took me so long to build an hour of material. Yeah, it took me. I would say it took me. It took me. Over ten years, easily. To, I think it took me fifteen years to build build a solid hour of material. But it's all original. It's, well, I mean, some of it's based on many, much of it is based on classics of magic. But yeah, all right. the stuff, the ideas behind it is original. That I weave the the uh, yeah. you know the prem the various uh, uh, you know premise for each routine is original and it comes directly from me. And then there's certain original technique in it. Yeah. So yes, uh, but. I, you know, that's why it's taken me so long to do that that yeah. sort of material. But it's also that's also why it's going to pay off, and that and that yeah, when I'm seventy. You know? geez, oh please. <laughs> <laughs> what do you What do you do to encourage yourself on those days when you're like, crap, I do not want to step foot out of this bed. I have those several times. A week. I hug my dog. Dude, yeah, dogs are rad. Yeah, they're pretty. Uh, I mean, they have no agenda except love. Right. Uh, what do I do? Uh, yeah. And I'm I, asking if other people want to listen. That's great. But I'm asking personally, just because lately it's just like I, <laughs> I kind of try to take a step back, and, yeah. and because I can, sometimes I can panic, <laughs> and so I try to put it theoretically on a shelf, so to speak. Okay where I try not to focus on it. That's easier said than done. Yeah. Because when the gigs aren't coming or the ideas aren't coming, I, I just feel like such a loser. You kind of hate yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and you want to get away. Sometimes yeah. I'll vent yeah. to my wife or uh, I'll try to get some sort of support. But for the most part, I just try to take a step back and take a deep breath and kind of focus on what's in front of me. And that's, like I said, it's easier said than done. Yeah. But I I, I think if you try to distance yourself a little bit away from it, you'll come back at much more level-headed. Yeah. And then say, you know what? Yes, this is happening, but it's not the end of the world. Yeah. 
I once lost uh, a pretty major gig because I basically tanked on stage, and I, I and this was at a major magic convention by a big producer. Yeah, and it was thousands upon thousands of dollars, an international gig, and I just choked because I was in front of all my peers, and ah oh, man, it was just a horrible experience, and I just wanted to quit magic after that. Yeah, but you know. Time heals. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, after a couple of months, I started feeling a little bit better and kind of got back in the game. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, we're all human. So, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's just about, you know, at the end of the day, I got in magic because I love magic. Yeah. And yeah, you know, I may have tanked at that performance and lost that big gig and probably will never have a relationship with this producer for that first impression. But I love magic. Yeah. And that's all it really comes down to. Fuck that guy. Right? <laughs> you know? I love magic and I want to do what makes me happy. Yeah. Uh, selfishly, admittedly, but... Hopefully, it will also make other people happy because I can share that yeah. and provide that level of escape. That's that's yeah. so encouraging, man. I feel like whether you're in the arts or in any sort of business, we're always waiting for someone to give us permission to do the thing that makes us happy. Once I get this position at work, then I'll be happy. Once I can do this for a living, then I'll be happy. And, and no matter how hard it gets when the gigs don't come, that's a good reminder, man, to just go, we're doing the thing right now yeah. that we want to do. Like, That's important because, yeah, yeah. So, so often we look so far ahead yeah. that the goal is so far away and yeah. impossible to achieve. And that's one of the reasons I started producing my own show and looking currently for a new venue for it because... I don't need some arts presenter to go and book me. No, I'm in charge of it. Right. I'm in charge of putting butts in seats. I'm yep. in charge of uh, organizing the show, printing out the flyers, yeah. the brochures for the uh, for the show, yeah. the posters, what have you. Uh, and it's my it's my baby. Yeah, you know I'm doing it. Yep. And if that's really what you want to do, if you really want people to come and see you perform, then you create a show and you start doing it. You're not waiting to be represented by, by a manager or an agent. You're not waiting for stuff to, to come. You're just doing it. Right. And, and, and you know, you got to be smart about it because if you want to take it to the next level, then, you yeah, you invite those managers and agents to the show right. that you're currently producing. But at least you went and got your feet wet and you're doing it. See, and not waiting for an opportunity. Like, yeah. So, because so many guys are like, "Oh, I'm not doing this or not doing that." It's like, "Well, what are you doing to have that happen?" Sure. And like you said, you go out, you make it happen. You make, you, you do it. You, just, you do it. Yeah, it's yeah. like that Nike slogan: "Just do it." Just I mean, do it. I mean, you uh, you have to take, you have to. You, it's like this podcast that you're doing. You're doing it. You know, you're you're not. You can wait to be invited on some radio show. So, right. You know, to I am share definitely your not having someone pay me to do this right now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah it's one of those things where you know we we live in a time where we have the ability to do things we couldn't do 10 15 20 years ago exactly i mean just to record this the way we're doing now would have cost thousands of dollars years and ago to reach an audience yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely so freaking encourage you man yeah what what can people do if they want to if they want to catch up and see what you're doing they want to come to one of your shows how do they get a hold of you What's the what's the website? What's the so the uh, the www the www <laughs> is arthurtrace.com uh, and I mean that's people can find my various social media links on there Facebook yep. uh, uh, forward slash Arthur Trace same with Twitter same with Instagram uh, but yeah get a hold of me on there and but more importantly. It'd be great if uh, some t you know our paths cross at some point. Just come up to me and say hello, and just say hey, wh what you're up to? Because yeah. I think you know ultimately, living on a phone or in front of your computer as much of a, as many of us do, we kind of lose that that personal interaction. And right. I think that's so powerful, just the the, the face to face. So. 
That's incredible. If you guys are listening to this right now, uh, you can click on the link. There will be links in the show notes for all of Arthur's stuff, and you can see where he's going to be, so you can go up to him in person and yeah. shake a hand. And But don't be stalkerish, all right? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> don't dedicate songs to him on, like, Coast 103.5 or whatever people do to stalk. I don't know. I've never had a stalker. Uh, I, I just got to say this, man, in closing, that uh, hearing you talk about moments where you wanted to quit but didn't, encourages me to keep going because having seen all the great art that you've created and put out there and things that would not exist in the world had you shut it down when you wanted to it's a motivator to me to say okay keep keep doing something so thank you man thank you for being well, thank here. you that, that and all these people right, are applying yeah <laughs> right on cue well that statement that you said there it just motivates me not to yeah. quit because yeah it's nice to know that uh, what we do affects people. Oh, hugely, yeah. man. Yeah. We world the world is so messed up, dude. But guess what? We get to give adult Santa Claus moments <laughs> that freaking doesn't exist. Sure. You're I was absolutely. watching you the other day at Jokers and Aces, seeing you perform, and just going ah, oh, like for a moment, it's real. Like magic is real, and wonder exists, and possibilities are endless. And that all happened because of something you created. So well, that's 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 great to know. On my Twitter, my on my Twitter, I my one little public statement is just my or, or my descriptor, if you will, that we all have on we're on Twitter is just trying to create something beautiful, and that's that's all that I try in my art is to try to create those beautiful moments that people can, you know, kind of get yeah. lost in, and and uh, and you know, that's 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 my goal in life is to provide those beautiful moments, and uh, and hopefully they just. I'm able to do that in the in, in the ongoing future. Awesome. That's redundant, but ongoing future. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful, man. Arthur Trace, everybody, go check him out. ArthurTrace.com. Thanks, Thanks, Taylor. I'm gonna turn this off. We can keep talking. <laughs>